Hi everyone, this is Jonathan J. Reinhardt from Wargaming Recon, and we're coming at you with this new episode of the show. So I want to welcome all of you new and long-time listeners alike. I think you're going to really enjoy this really cool episode of Wargaming Recon. We are the only member of the TSR Podcast Network to discuss historical and New England gaming, and you are listening or watching video for episode 215. Wet Palettes Reviewed. As I said, I am Jonathan J. Reinhardt, and today we're coming at you with a review that's been a long time in the making. So this is kind of our big extravaganza where we cover not one, not two, but three, that's right, three different wet palettes. And way back, I actually kind of want to give you a little brief bit about what was the impetus for the show. So way back, I had talked with the one and only Alyssa Faden, who people might know from all of her gaming work. And you'll have to excuse me as I reach for something I want to share with all of you. So she told me about this Kickstarter that was coming out, and she said I should check it out for this Everlasting Wet Palette. And I was like, okay, you know, that sounds pretty cool, right? I think I would like to cover it on the show. I think I would like to maybe review it and check it out. I love wet palettes. I know not everyone does. And I was like, let's do a thing for it, right? And see how it goes. And very kindly, on behalf of Enfilade, they sponsored us to pick up the wet palette right here. So we backed it on Kickstarter and we backed this. And this is, I got to say, the extra large One Studio XL set of it. And in thinking about it, I was like, I don't want to just do a review of one wet palette for the entire episode. Because that's like kind of crazy, right? To do just one for the whole show. I said, let's spread it a little bit. Let's do a bunch of them. So the original plan was to do four. And due to human error, aka mine, <laughs> we actually have uh, scaled it back to three wet palettes. And today we're going to be sharing them with you. And I'm going to be talking about some of their pros, some of their cons, a little bit about each of them, and going to give my recommendation as to whether um, I think they're worth getting or not, and what my pick is overall. So reviews kind of are a little subjective, right? <laughs> Depending on whether I'm looking at it or you're looking at it, we might have different opinions, and that's okay. But I want you to know about some of the criteria that I'm using. So I'm uh, looking at things like cost. I'm looking at things like usefulness. I'm looking at stuff like customer service. I'm looking at what I'm kind of just going to refer to as like an X factor, which is kind of an overall score of a combination of all attributes of it. Things like how well is it made? How useful is it? Uh, how affordable is it? Uh, and to try to come up with like a top pick, a best buy for things and if there are any just like losers i'm going to say there's a loser and if something's really great i'm going to say it's really great like with all reviews i want to start off by saying first of all we have not been paid to do any of the reviews i did mention that enfilade kindly sponsored us to back the kickstarter for uh everlasting wet palette by redgrass games that did not mean that we're giving them better score uh than anyone else because of that and as you guys know, we give you our honest and unfiltered opinion on stuff. We try to be a place that you can trust to come to for reviews and product information for anything dealing with wargaming. So we think that you'll find what we have to say useful here. And I don't know about you, but this process kind of expanded my horizons to do things that I never would have tackled otherwise. So let's start with a wet palette that's been around a while. And I actually still have stuff in it, so I've got to be careful. But it is the Privateer Press P3 Wet Palette. And it's been out for a long, long time. You can get it from your local game store. You can get it online. Uh, we'll have a link. Uh, we have show notes, uh, which I know not a lot of you enjoy using. But we'll have a link in the show notes to where you can get this over at the War Store. It runs for about $19.99 American. And... It is a nice, smaller size wet palette. Sometimes when you're painting, you don't have a whole lot of space, right, to do your painting. You just need to get it done and over with. You want something that's quick 
and easy and simple to use. The P3 wet palette fits all that criteria. As I said, it's easily obtainable from uh, many local game stores, or you can get it online. Uh, a war store happens to come to mind, but I know other vendors carry them as well. At $19.99, let's say $20 American, that's pretty reasonable when it comes to a wargaming product, right? You come across other things that you're like, oh my goodness, those are so expensive. This is not one of those. It is a smaller size, so it's not going to take up a whole lot of space on your table, right? Because when you're painting, you might line up a lot of things to work on. If you're doing an army, right, maybe you have a whole unit or a whole regiment there in front of you, a whole squad, and maybe you're doing assembly line. So you're like, I pick up one guy, I paint, I pick up a second guy, I paint, a third guy, I paint, and so forward. Or maybe you're doing a big train piece and you got that plop down in front of you. The last thing you want when you do something like that is a huge thing. And also, it's small enough that you could travel with it. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, since it is a smaller size, though, it's not taking up that valuable table real estate, and it's easier to bring with you. Using it was pretty straightforward and simple. With most of these wet palettes, if you're not familiar how they tend to work, the concept is... You have a device, usually with some sort of lid, and there'll be some sort of foam or medium, right, that soaks up some water because you put some water in. Not enough to flood everything, but enough to kind of keep that soaked. And there'll be some sort of like parchment paper or other special topping that goes on top. And it gets some of the moisture from underneath, enough to keep it just slightly wet, but not like to be underwater or floating, so that when you then put your paints on it, they stay wet a lot longer. They're not going to dry out on you mid-session, or you could even use the uh, wet palette multiple sessions. So you have that there, but it also makes it easier to mix your paints so that you can put, say you have two or three different colors there, you put it there, and it would work just like a normal palette for anyone who does other types of painting. But this helps it to last a little longer. So that's the general idea behind a wet palette. This does all of that. There are some things it does better, some things it doesn't do as well. But for $19.99 American, you kind of have to go with what you expect. I have to say, this particular one, I've had for a very long time. This was one I had that I had used previously, and I thought, you know what? Let's put this in, because it's still available, people can get it. And for a lot of people, this might be the only one that you come across. What are some things that aren't so great about it, right? So it's not watertight you're probably going to have a hard time finding a wet palette that is watertight. This one is not, so don't go throwing it in your bag with all your gaming stuff. When you have water in it, make sure it's dry. You can bring it with you wherever you go, but don't have water in it. Don't have any liquids in it, so that way you bring it with you, and then you can implement it and use it and add the water and do that whole process, right? For me, when I used it recently, it dried out after a few days, so I had put water in. I had done all the stuff that I had done before and then I put some paints in just to test it and after like two or three days the paints were still there but there was this outer shell rubbery shell that I couldn't get through because the paints are latex right so I couldn't get through to actually get to the paint so it did not really keep them uh, as dry as they should be. Mine the lid on has this latch they all have a latch but this latch right here is tricky to close and I don't know if it's specifically the one that I have or if they're all like that so it could have been that it wasn't latched all the way. My memory of using it when I first got it, oh, many moons ago when I was still in college, was that I was able to use it and it would last two or three or four days. Probably not a whole lot longer than that, but something like that. Uh, and for me, an appeal of a wet palette is, I'm a wargamer dad. Many of you might be parents or may only have short snippets of time, right? That you want to paint in or that you can paint. And maybe you're trying to, paint something like this, right? And this is a pretty simple thing for a lot of people, right? I'll come back to this in uh, a few minutes. This is one of the things I was actually painting, but you might not have a lot of time, so you want to put your paints on the wet palette so that way they stay, they don't dry out, because perhaps you made a very custom mixture that you're using, and ideally you might write down all the ratios of stuff. Henry Hyde is famous for having this whole book where he writes down the exact mixes that he uses for his different troops and his wars with the Fultanian succession. You should check out 
that he combined it together as an ebook. You can buy it online. I believe it's on Amazon, actually. You can get it as a Kindle book. Um, but you can definitely get it from his website at Henry Hyde's Wargaming. And he might even have a link to it on his Patreon as well. So you should check him out. Anyway, uh, it dried out on me this time, unlike in the past and i was like oh and that's the primary reason for it right also i mean it's plastic it's mass produced right but it feels kind of cheaply made the plastic doesn't feel so nice like i mentioned about the clasp right here i'll tap on it for the audio folks uh i don't know if it was mine or what it was but it just it didn't close easily so that could have been a problem it's not watertight so you do have some issues with this but it's 19 dollars 99 I'm going to come back to that and give an overall kind of uh, view later on. Next, we're going to move to the Everlasting Wet Palette. And I need to say that this is the XL size. It's the studio one. It's a big one. There's also a smaller one that's orange. This one I'm being very careful with because of, <laughs> of a negative. We're going to come to in a few moments. Uh, like I said, I backed it on the Kickstarter. You can get it from redgrassgames.com. We'll have a link in the show notes should you want to check them out over at wargamingrecon.com slash WR215. This retails for 49.90 euros, which is approximately $57.68 American. Now, as you can tell from looking at it, I think it's very aesthetically pleasing to look at. It has just like really nice lines to it. It looks cool, nice corners. You have this nice elasticy, but it's cloth fabricy kind of strap to help keep the lid on. You put the lid on, and it like almost suctions in, so that feels really cool. It's a large surface, so you could actually, if you were doing, say, this is a case where you might want uh, a larger wet palette like this. If you're doing a bunch of troops, but maybe you're doing a bunch of different types and you're pre-mixing things, so each area could be uh, set, like maybe this is for your horses, this is for your artillery, this is for your tanks, this is for Regiment 1, Regiment 4, Regiment 5, whatever. You all have the custom mixes that you've done. And they're all here, so that way you don't have to keep on swapping out your thing. I believe what it uses is kind of this, they call it a hydration foam that you put on, and then there's like a, a special film that goes on top, uh, which is different than the wet palette one. The wet, uh, P3 wet palette one is more like a parchment paper, but this is kind of like a fancier version of that, which you can buy those separate from Redgrass Games as well. I think this is reusable limited so and the hydration foam definitely is you can just rinse it out after you get paints on it you don't have to worry like i said it's very aesthetically pleasing and it also comes with this really cool accessory called the wavy and as you can tell from looking at it if you're watching the video and if not i will describe it for you it has five little kind of indentations which would be great for putting paint in you can use it to create your own wash if you were doing something like that if you had a pigment and then you were just adding your medium in there uh, future floor wax or whatever I actually like to do it if I'm not mixing paint to just put the paint in here and then pull out the color and put it on what I'm working on it is magnetized we're gonna come back to that in a minute so it has these two magnets which allows it to connect to your everlasting wet palette and this has magnets on three sides so it just snaps on and I'll let you guys hear that snap or watch it if you're watching the video it's a pretty solid connection now let's talk about some of the cons right for me the highlight of this wet palette is the wavy accessory and I gotta say I used this wet palette for a while and then I kind of gave up on it and I was like this wavy accessory though this is great you can actually buy this separately if you like but I could use almost anything else I could get really cheap version of this like at your local arts and crafts store they have them they're round and they're just these little indentations and you can put the paint in I think there were construction issues with this and I actually talked with the designers on I talked with them through Kickstarter because I had questions about stuff and they don't seem to agree with me so this could just be my own personal thoughts or it could be a real issue uh, in the device and again I'm not going to show you it because I got I learned the hard way right <laughs> because it's not waterproof we'll come back to that in a minute uh, 
water sloshes out and I get liquids in there from uh, some testing I was doing. There's this kind of rubber ribbon that goes around the side that's supposed to seal it. And there's this little kind of groove that it does come down and creates a gap. And I found when I would press on this, I'd hear a whooshing, almost like air was coming in and out. And I thought if air is coming in and out, then surely water will be too. And that might be a problem. Maybe it's not going to keep things moist for as long as it should maybe it's going to cause them to dry out quicker so i was concerned about that i also had a problem uh where the magnets on the wavy fell out during delivery like i i got it and i was like where's the magnets and it turned out they fell out and i wasn't quite sure what to do so i had contacted the creators through kickstarter because it was part of the fulfillment from the kickstarter project if you were to buy this now, you would just contact that customer support on their website. And I talked to them about this. And I was like, so here's what happened. You know, I think you guys use the wrong adhesive or something to bond the plastic to the magnets. I don't know what's going on. Uh, I'd like to get this resolved. And for me, ideally, I didn't want to just glue them back in because I was afraid, like, what if I use the wrong glue? What if I don't seat them properly? What if they're not flush? What if I do some sort of user error and, like, it's not my fault it arrived like that. It was broken. I mean, fixable, but broken, right? And so I wanted a replacement wavy. I don't want a whole new thing, but I want a replacement wavy. And I mentioned other concerns. Their customer service, and I should say, this is a French company, so there could be just some cultural differences here going on. Maybe some linguistic, linguistic issues where my native English to their English learned over there doesn't isn't as compatible, uh, compatible, could be me, could be them, but they accused me of trying to get special treatment in exchange for giving them a better review. And the background is, I was like, you know, I'll get this thing, I want to get it replaced, and I want to get this taken care of because I want to review the product on my show. And I said a little bit about Wargaming Recon, and I wanted to, you know, be like, here we go, give them the benefit of the doubt. It, we get the stuff all worked out so that I can review a working, not a partially broken, eas again, easily repaired, I understand, but partially broken product. Like, I want it to be like what anyone else would get. Because I presumed mine was a one-off. Maybe a few other backers had this kind of issue, but that generally, I'd like to think that the mainstream production line uh, of what anyone would get would not have these issues. And so I said, okay, let's can we resolve this and do that? And they sent me this very, what seemed to be stern reminder that they have this policy of never given custom or special um, treatment to get a better review of their product, which is not what I was trying to do. And I was like flabbergasted because I've never had anyone accuse me of doing that. And this was not what I was intending to do. And I was really just like taken aback about this. There's one thing that above all else that I really try to hold true to with Wargaming Recon, and that is to give a completely unbiased and fair opinion and coverage of things for you, the listener, right? Because if I'm not doing that, how can you trust me? How can we have any sort of relationship? And clearly we have one, right? Because I've been doing this so long, much longer than almost anyone else, longer than anyone else around, right? And many of you have stuck with me for this whole journey. We pump out so many episodes over these years, so many hours of content. If I wasn't trustworthy, you would not listen. You wouldn't tune in, right? And I kind of got things straightened out with them. They, I ended up agreeing to take uh, replacement magnets because, of course, the magnets came out and I didn't know where they were. I glued them in. And there's no way if you're watching the video you can see, but because of how I glued them in, one of them actually is not completely flush, which I was not entirely happy about. It still works, but for me, it kind of muddied the experience. I actually talked with some other war gamers and other people, industry people, to see if I was misreading the situation or if it was me. And the consensus was that the Redgrass Games was not giving me good customer service, that they were accusing me of trying to get special treatment, but that it was probably some sort of cultural miscommunication going on there and so i want to stress that i think that's what it is i had this experience that does not mean that you will have it uh, i have to say that 
customer service aside, just using the product, I think is unnecessarily difficult. And you're going to say, how difficult is it to use a wet palette? So this wet palette has very specific instructions for what you need to do. And I'm not going to go through the details of each step for what you have to do. It's just, it's not user friendly. You should be able to just take a wet palette, right? In this case, the hydration foam, you should be able to take the container, you put the hydration foam in, you should be able to just pour some water in and get it soaked to the appropriate level of being soaked, wet, but not you know, flooded and put your paper on top and then you should be able to smooth it out, get it, the air bubbles out and then go to town, right? But this is like a certain method you have to go by, a certain temperature and it's better if you do this, that and the other. It's very specific, right? And numerous people had complained that it didn't work and it turned out for these other people, these other Kickstarter backers, the reason why it didn't work is because they did not specifically follow the instructions to be fair to Redgrass Games they give you the instructions there. They say, go to their website. They have to, video tutorials to watch. It's there. If you get one of these, do all that. Do all that homework. Is it insurmountable? No, but I don't think you should have that high of a bar to entry for this because I don't know about you, but painting can be difficult enough without adding this extra layer of like, whoa, you got to do all this other stuff first to get it to go. So I had issues with that. I think you can have some product difficulties if you don't completely follow the instructions and do things the way that they say. I also think this is rather expensive. As I said, it comes out to about just under $58 American. It's 49.90 euros. And I think that's on the high end. And granted, again, I need to stress, because like I said, we do our best to be completely fair. That is for this really big one. And this big one uh, sizing is 7.9 inches by 11.8 inches. Uh, their actual description of this here on their box, and I'm reading it, is that it's made for pros and enthusiasts looking for a huge painting area. It's perfect for medium to large size paint stations for acrylic paint only. It comes with uh, extra large foam, the ABS case, which is a type of plastic, extra large hydration paper. Um, that's like the uh, parchment paper that would go on top the cloth fabric strap band and the wavy and it actually has quick setup instructions here and I tell you I did the quick setup instructions and I just I found like the water never lasted and I don't know what's going on with that I do want to say this is actually a pro uh, which should have been under my pro grouping the paint never dried out the water didn't last so well, but the paint never dried out. So that was great. Um, some words of caution. Be careful when you open it because it does suction really well here along the edges. So you really have to pull up. And if you already have water in this stuff, you might get it all over yourself as I did or all over your painting station or your table. Uh, and I do want to actually just address the waterproof aspect of it. In the game uh not the game in the kickstarter pro uh, project they specifically say in the text that it's not waterproof but they have a video on their kickstarter campaign that says you can take it and just throw it in your bag and you don't have to worry about it and the way they phrase it and the way they show things gives a very strong implication and suggestion that it's waterproof enough for you to do so there's that miscommunication there Really, you need to check their website for the current information. But for anyone who backed on a Kickstarter, could leave a sour taste in their mouth. I know that was some contention for people, and it's something to keep in mind. Uh, so let's move on from Everlasting Wet Palette. I did something I wasn't sure I was going to do, and I made a homemade one. <laughs> so right here, I went to my local dollar store, and you can see I still have the water in here. And I was like, okay, I need a little sandwich container. I need a sponge and I need parchment paper and that's literally all you need. So I spent three dollars on this and actually that three dollars got me two, actually three sandwich containers so I could have three going. It got me two sponges. My daughter took one because she likes to clean and <laughs> I said sure why not and a thing of parchment paper. Uh, this parchment paper is 25 square feet. I used the tiniest amount 
a parchment paper for this. Uh, parchment paper is not reusable, so you just throw that out. I've had this water in here <laughs> for about, I don't know, a month and a half, two months by the time I'm recording this September 7th. And I also did things like that with the other wet palettes because one of the things with the everlasting one is that the that's supposed to set it apart is that it's foam that you use is supposed to be antimicrobial. A lot of people who do wet palettes do homemade ones, maybe some version of this, right? And things get moldy very quickly. Uh, this one doesn't have any mold, but the water kind of has that kind of gooey, thick, viscous, viscous kind of thing going on which lets you know it's been there for too long so you're not supposed to get any mold that kind of stuff with the everlasting wet palette i've never had mold on the p3 either uh, but that's why i get the water still going in here so the price for this like i said i spent three bucks and you figure plus tax whatever that is in your area so i spent three bucks for this but really to do one of these like it's less so i spent a dollar for three containers here so 33 cents for the container the sponge was 50 cents because I got two sponges for a dollar. So you're talking 73 cents, 0.33 repeating threes. And then the parchment paper was a dollar. But for the amount I got, let's round it up to a dollar, <laughs> which is on the high end. So one dollar to make this. Um, really easy to make, really easy to use. You see, I put water in, I got the stuff. It's kept it moist. Uh, and you can see a sheen. I could probably still use this right now if I wanted to, <laughs> which is great. It's been sealed. You can see this actually, uh, if you watch a video, this beads of perspiration on it. We'll have, if you're not, we'll have pictures up on our uh, social media so you guys can check that out. Guys and ladies, I should say. I want to be gender inclusive. Uh, and negatives though, right? Generally, when you paint, you want something lower to the table. The P3 can be even a little high for some people, but the P3 is lower. The Studio XL Everlasting Wet Palette's nice and low, very narrow lip. And actually, the Studio XL, you can use the lid as another wet palette to give that another thumbs up for that. This is pretty high, right? And it all depends on your container that you get. If you have containers at home, great. You can save even more money. But otherwise, like, this is this is really cheaply made, right? Like, talk about cheap. This is just like, eh. And this is what you do if you just kind of want to do quick and dirty. You don't want to spend any money. Um, it works. It's a great, eh. I mean, it gets the job done. Uh, it's not something I love. It doesn't look cool. It doesn't look aesthetically pleasing. The plastic is probably really cheap. And the last thing we really want in the world is more plastic, but you kind of have to use that with this kind of stuff, right? So it's not wonderful, but it kept the paint moist. It was affordable. <laughs> There's no real customer service to deal with. That's a homemade. Everyone has their own recipe for homemade wet palettes. If you don't have a dollar store near you, you're probably going to spend more money because you're going to go to, I don't know if you go a big box store or something, I guess, or online and buy all the stuff separately or to get the, just the size you need. But you can get, I mean, like I said, I got three of the little lunch containers, right? I, I got whatever size I wanted, but you can get as big or as small as you want. So you can really customize it as need be because uh, you're doing it on your own and you're not using some other company's product. Let's then take these and evaluate them okay so we're going to go from most expensive to least so everlasting is the most expensive at just under 58 american middle is the p3 at what i say 1999 american and then rounding up on the high side of a dollar is this homemade one so the homemade one obviously is most affordable the most aesthetically pleasing the coolest to look at is the everlasting wet palette really neat innovative designs going on here um the wavy the magnets all that kind of stuff is really cool uh so that's something i like about it but if i had to pick just one wet palette that did it for me i'd have a hard time because they all have their faults and some of the faults are minor some are significant uh the homemade one is just kind of like eh it's not great it, again it's very cheap and you're just like, I don't know. And it's homemade, right? So, like, there's nothing wrong with homemade, but if you want a wet palette, like, you want, like, a wet palette, and this is probably going to be hard to uh, bring with you, and then the worst thing you could do is, like, you, you, you have this all empty, and you bring it with you, and then you forget that's what you're using it for. You had all these paints in, and then, like, you put all this stuff in, you put food or whatever in. So that's, that's a problem. 
the P3 one this time around. I don't know why it was this time around, but not in the past. The paint's dried out. That's a big no-no. Like, that's the reason you want to use it. The Everlasting one, setup, and everything was way too complicated. And then I had those customer service issues, which you might not have. Uh, but then the construction issues as well that I mentioned. Uh, and I hope they fixed it in the m m updated models that they're selling. But, like, the magnets came out on me. Uh, there was the gap that I mentioned. So, it's just like the construction of it wasn't great. Uh, idea was great, but there was all these other issues. So, like, none of them were like, whoa, look at that, amazing to me. And actually, even as much as I like the Wavy, I've been scrubbing. I've used every single thing, uh, every single container a lot because I've been doing a lot of painting lately. We'll talk about that in a few moments. And I've been scrubbing a lot. And then I've been using my nails to try to get the paint off. And there's still, like, a bunch of paint stuck to this thing. It's a pain in the rear end to clean. And maybe I'm just not cleaning it right, or I don't know. It could just be me. But even that, I'm like, really? This should not be this difficult. You should just be able to get it to go, sit down, paint, and then clean up as need be. So, Everlasting is kind of cool, but when you add in the cost factor with all the other issues, for me, not worth the money. I think they could get there, they need to make some tweaks and update some stuff. And then maybe it could be, but I think even without like just under $58 American, I think that's a lot. 30 bucks. There you go. For 30 bucks, I'd say it's great. The P3 one is the one I used for a lot for many, many years. And I love this one, right? But the paint dried out. So you're a goner. For the price, and if that's all you can get, do it. Believe it or not, although I haven't used it this much. I think the homemade one might be your best bet because like the everlasting one, I kept the paint moist. This is going for about a month <laughs> here, a month and a half. It is very affordable. It's easy to get, easy to use. There are cons. They all have cons, right? But I think if you're not sure if you like a wet palette and you want to check it out, make one yourself first and then check out one of these other ones. Now, there was a fourth wet palette that we were going to do and... I should count and we didn't do it yet uh, but I picked it up on Amazon it's a stay wet palette sta wet palette by Masterson which a lot of artists use for oils and things like that and its instructions are even more complicated than the everlasting one and I it kind of got lost in the shuffle during the move uh, of cleaning things out so the moves not happened yet but just that so that's why it hasn't been done yet that'll happen at a later point for me, my overall winner, which really surprises me for the wet palettes, my top pick is a homemade one. And then my second pick, even though the stuff dried out, is the P3. And the reason why I'm picking this when really this should be dead last because the stuff dried and the everlasting one, the stuff didn't. It's because although this time around it dried out and I got to figure out why that was. In the past, I didn't have that trouble. Eventually, it would dry out, but it was not that quick. So something happened, and I don't know what it was. I was doing this actually in the muggiest time of year here, and I don't know why, but maybe I didn't latch it right. Maybe it was user error. So then that means the third place is the Everlasting Wet Palette. And I think the Everlasting Wet Palette could be a lot better. If they can take care of those construction issues, it'd be great. Um, for me, then it would go in the number two spot. But like I said, between the price and then those, just the setup, it's just, I don't know why it's so, maybe I'm reading it wrong. Maybe it's me. And if it is, please let me know if any of you happen to find out and I will issue a correction as need be, but I just, I found it unnecessarily complicated. So those are our opinions on the wet palette extravaganza. And I wanted to use this time to talk about a few things here on the show so the first is i was doing all this painting right because i had to test these wet palettes and i got into a painting groove which is pretty amazing so i've been having a lot of content go up on our listener facebook group which is the wargaming recon fan group i think it's what we call it and uh you can just check it out uh, on facebook and sharing pictures in a journey and i actually did a whole blog post something i haven't really done in a long time talking about painting these field emplacements 
from Ironclad Miniatures, which we got for review purposes from Ironclad Miniatures and painted them up and used all sorts of paints. And I actually bought new paints from the Hobby Bunker where I got some GW paints and things like that. And I actually went and bought new brushes for stuff. So painted these, which were a lot of fun, used the wet palettes for them. So did a whole kind of in-depth kind of thing. And I was really proud of myself. I spent about a week painting these and trying to figure out what to do. Used Lead Bear's tufts on them. I had some army painter tufts that I did. There was a lot of discussion for what to do with the sandbags. Cause these field emplacements have sandbags on them. They're earthen works, there's wood inside. Uh, there's a anti-tank gun emplacement. There's like a, a weapons emplacement that has like a mound of dirt that comes up all sides with wood inside to kind of keep it so that'd be great for like a mortar team for bolt action or something like that and then there's a two-man dugout and there's a one-man dugout as well and there's other stuff that iron um, ironclad miniatures has that i would love for us to cover and review as well so spent about a week working on those that was a lot of fun to do and then i painted another thing I'm trying to get through our review product here and i'll come back to the ironclad miniatures in a moment because i do want to spend a little more time on them but also um did some things in the basement these are two columns inspired by ghost archipelago Frostgrave, that i painted so they're md are they mdf i always get it wrong hdf so they're laser cut in three millimeter hdf these were really easy to assemble and believe it or not they're the fastest thing i've ever painted in my entire life so I primed them with spray painted Chaos Black from Games Workshop, set it all black. It's wood. I then, oh, I, one thing I should say, I primed them on their version of sprues because I figured that would be easier. I glued them using just, I have this super gel um, glue, I can't remember the name of it, uh, testers maybe, um, that my buddy Carrie had suggested. So I glued these. They went together. They were actually one of them was really hard to get in because like I was trying to glue it in the fit is really tight it goes into the base so the base is like a pedestal base but it's two parts so you have a bigger flat base and then you have a smaller part that has these little slots and then the column itself is four sides that just kind of fit together with like a jigsaw kind of uh, fit so I was trying to hold those in and then get it into the base while the gel glues in there and it's drying and I'm trying to get, force it in it's so tight I'm like, why is it so tight? And I realized the reason why is because the little tabs that go into the base were primed with paint, with the spray paint. And that was just enough to make it hard to get in because the fit is just, dry fitting is such, so tight. It's such a tight, clean fit that with the paint, it's a problem. So I would suggest if you get these, don't paint the tabs. And so then I had the same problem on the top and the same with both of them. And I was really trying to figure out how was I going to paint these things because... I wanted to do, have some sort of like Incan or South American or Central American Mayan uh, inspiration going on for these or Aztec, Aztec kind of inspired. So I painted them, uh, I said black, and then I had some GW Citadel Talarn stone, which is a foundation or a base paint. So I did that and then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to dry brush them, right? Because then I'll ink them and then I'll dry brush them again and then I'll seal them. But when I dry brush them, I was tried a couple different grays because I wanted like a, a gray kind of stone look. And then I actually used, it's like Adeptus Astartes foundation paint, I think it is, because the gray is darker. So I actually dry brushed them and I ended up with this re reverse relief kind of look where I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. Should I ink it and then dry brush again or what? But then I found some pictures online of some Aztec stone carvings and they look just like this where the recesses are where the stone's been chiseled away and the raised areas are what remains of the raised areas are darker and I, I was like I think I like it but maybe I'm overthinking things by trying to do other stuff maybe I'm gonna gild a lately and checked online and people agreed with me so I still have to seal these things but they were a joy to do the Oh, and I should say they cost $6.50 for two of them. And there's instructions on thingsfromthebasement.com on how to uh, assemble them and that kind of stuff. And Yorg is great because if you have any questions, you just contact him and he can walk you through the whole process. Something I learned 
from Architects of War, where it's like, those instructions will be there forever. I never need to download them. I'm not saying things from the basement's going out of business or anything. When you buy the kit, go and download the instructions, save them as a PDF on your computer or an external hard drive to the cloud, whatever, so that way you always have them. Now, a great thing about the Ironclad Miniatures field positions is there's no assembly required. The models are really nice. They're a resin, the 28 millimeter, very easy to work with. They took paint really well. I primed them by spraying them black, and then I did a bunch of different browns. So I did a brown, I did a, a, a brown ink, a GW brown ink, and then I dry brushed them again with um, Sylvetheth bark, I think it is, Sylvanetheth bark, and then I worked on the um, sandbags, and then they kind of look a little much too much like stone, so I tried to dirty them up a little but not as much as they were and I added the tufts and everything but these are really easy to paint uh, the empty open on the bottom so you can really get in and paint it every which way they look great I took I staged some photos so I put my cigar box battle plush mat it's my um, new grassland mat I put some crescent root buildings out that I have I put some Bachman uh, scenescapes trees out there like five or six inch tall trees i did uh my <laughs> i went all out. mike Payne made these uh, polystyrene forms that i put underneath the mat to give some elevation and then i also used my wargamers terrain uh stuff i have like rivers and things like that that i put out and then i staged pictures and I put them and i put uh models i have uh, a bolt action army uh that i got from adler hobby um so I was offloading it, so it was pre-painted, which was great. And I put them in, and I staged it, and like everything just looks great. I think I'm actually going to do a couple more coats of dull coat, though, just because I don't... One of the problems with resin, it can break easily, and my chip easily, and it's been all this time. I spent a week, right, uh, on painting. And when I say a week, it's not like every day. There was a couple days where I didn't paint at all, and a couple days where I spent like three or four hours. I probably spent like six hours total painting everything. So that's that the gorgeous pieces and the pricing i feel is really good you got to get them from the uk though because they're there's no u.s distributor so if you're over in europe or elsewhere it's not a bad deal at all um, but just to kind of give you an idea and these are prices are going to be in british pounds so currently with the whole brexit thing not getting into the politics of it but with the whole brexit thing uh, if you're here in America, you're going to get a deal. So the weapons pit is $3 and um, £3.50 uh, worth every penny. The anti-tank position, £3.50. So that'd be great for like a pack gun or anything like that. Uh, you can get the two-man foxhole for £3.50 or the one-man foxhole for £2. There's a, a strong point that would be great for trenches. That's £15. There's supply dumps for £3.50. Uh, what else does he have? He has a field position log built bunker for eight pounds fifty. That looks also really cool. And then a slit trench for three pounds fifty. And then he actually has a whole thing of trenches and everything. So you could use these for Walter One, Walter Two. You could use them for almost anything that you really would like to do. So I really think they're very cool. You should check them out. We'll have a link online, or just go and check online ironcladminiatures.com. Well, those are the things that I've been up to. I'm working my way through more painting. I actually have some more things for the basement stuff to do. Originally, we were going to have Adrian come on here with me, but he had uh, some family stuff he had to take care of. I do know that our friend Joshua down under is doing much better with his health. And I believe he's getting the okay from his doctor to return to audio editing. So not this episode, I don't think. Um, but the next one will sound much better because he will have done the audio editing for it. So that's pretty cool that that will be coming out and you will be able to hear all those kind of cool things. And I know he has really strong opinions about wet palettes. Um, I think he really dislikes them, to be honest. So I'm hoping to get a chance for him to come on the show to kind of just talk a little bit more about wet palettes and painting and things that he likes and dislikes and all that kind of stuff to see what's going on there. And then we've actually had a pretty strong response to our previous episode, which was Adrian and I just kind of chatting. We talked about gaming stuff we've done and painting, and we talked a little bit about what we had done with the Hobby Bunker game day, 
and go into that and just um, a few odds and ends. I want to let all of you in on a little secret. Adrian and I didn't really, and this is an awful thing to say, we were a little worried about the episode because it was so different from anything that we had done. We weren't sure that we had enough content for a whole episode or that anyone would really enjoy listening to it. And really, we should have just believed in ourselves and be like, we're doing good stuff because people really enjoyed what we had to say. And numerous people had commented that they had a lot of fun with it. Uh, I know some people had difficulties accessing it. It was because I edited it and did some silly things, but I fixed it. It's one of our top downloaded episodes so far this year, which was a surprise for me. I believe within like 24 hours of it coming out, we had, I think, almost... 2,000 or 3,000 downloads which was pretty crazy and I was just like wow that was a lot so like it for to me it clearly resonated with people uh almost as much of a response as when I talked about gaming against anxiety uh with my anxiety issues and how gaming helps me with that and I have to say I've made a lot of personal progress with my anxiety and depression and painting has been euphoric for me which is something I didn't think would happen, but I've been on such like an emotional high from painting and maybe it's the fumes, right? No, I'm joking, but it's been great. And I know any long time listener will be like, wait, Jonathan, you always say like painting is not your thing or whatever. And I think I'm going to have to <laughs> amend that statement if you'll allow me to. Okay. So I think the statement really needs to be painting armies. Isn't really my thing. So like you notice the stuff that I talked in this episode about painting were like field positions because I love doing terrain, I love artillery, I love tanks, that kind of stuff. So they're basically one-off pieces, right? The columns, there was just a couple of them. They went together really quickly, painted really easily. So that was pretty cool. So that kind of stuff I like, but having like 16 or 20 guys for one unit and then knowing I have more units to do just does nothing for me because there's so many parts to do, right? Like the columns, they're one color painter. So yeah, I mean, I did three colors if you count this black spray prime and then the uh, light gray that I, I base coated them and then the dark gray that I highlighted, um, that I dry brushed them with. And then even if you, the field positions, it's brown, right? So I did black for a spray. Then I did different shades of brown and brown inks. And I mean, the sandbags are tan. So I did different khakis and tans for that. But it's a very limited color palette, which I think I like. But if you're looking at an army, especially if you're looking for, I don't know, Napoleonics or anything fancy like that, there's so many colors. And there's such a small area to paint. Even if you're doing 28 mil, like, you don't have a whole lot of leeway. So you spend, for me, I would spend a lot more time doing corrections. Oh, the paint got onto the hand. I got to fix it and do this and that. Uh, so that would be a problem. Uh, but painting has been really helpful to me. So I want to share a bit of feedback about the last episode with Adrian. And uh, listener Jamie had said uh, he just kind of wanted to chime in, actually, about some of the conversation that Adrian and I had. And I'll, I'll cover the conversation quickly in a moment. But he said that, quote, my view is that episode numbers are excellent. And the show guide, I never view. Clear titles are great, though. You're good at that, unquote. And he and I actually talked more about it. But to recap, for those of you who missed last episode, Adrian and I were talking about the changes for the show. And like I said, that last episode, 214, was very quickly put together. Usually I spend a lot of time prepping, right? But with the way my life's going now, I can't spend all that time prepping. And... I was like, well, how am I going to do a show? And sometimes that would mean just dropping in and getting the show out and maybe not having as much done to it. Whereas like today's episode, right, with the wet pellets, I spent a month and a half prepping, checking for mold, using them, uh, communicating with the companies, and just all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's time painting and just all that. So I spent a lot of time dealing with it. Whereas the one with Adrian, like we sat down and we just talked about what was going on. And we actually had enough stuff gaming stuff to talk about which was wonderful we filled the whole show with it and would we always have that i don't know but 
it was so relieving to be able to do that. And I had said to Adrian that I wanted to find other ways to kind of save time so that I can still create a good quality podcast for all of you to enjoy without having to spend hours and hours and hours that I may not have prepping for it. And so some things that I had suggested was that maybe I would do away with uh, episode numbers that I wasn't sure how much people really like or use them, that I might do away with mentioning the show notes as much in the episode. In the past, I, I would start off at the beginning of the show and say, you can find out more about what we talk about at our show notes uh, by going to blah, 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 blah. And then I would say it again, usually somewhere in the middle. And then again at the end, because people remember things if you say them three times, right? You have to do at least three times and that repetition sticks in someone's brain. So like for years, I've been saying how painting is not really my thing, right? And that is stuck probably in your brain. And now I'm saying, I'm going to amend that. It kind of is. So I'm going to have to say this a few more times for it to stick in your brain. And I said to Adrian, those two things. And then, like, I'm always talking about the episode guide. Check out the episode guide. Things are on the episode guide. And I suspected that people weren't using it. And that really it was more for me than for you. And Adrian pushed back a little on some things and on others. He's like, okay, fine, whatever. And it seems that not just from Jamie, but from other feedback we've received, that my thinking is correct. So I believe what will be happening is I'm not going to mention the episode guide anymore. I'm probably going to turn that on the website to a private facing side. So it'll be on the back end. You guys will never see it again. I will keep episode numbers and I'll be doing like I've been doing in the past where the episode numbers are in there, but they're at like, if you look at your, however you consume the podcast, if you use iTunes or whatever, right? I always front load the episode. So it's not what gaming recon episode 215, what palette review it's what palette review we're going to recon number 215. So that way you still have the episode number so you can make sure that you have them in order and it's easy for me to reference it. Oh yeah, back in episode 200. So that way you can easily find 200. But you still know what the episode is going to be about from that. And I've also decided I'm going to make some other changes as well. So for example, I'm not going to mention the show notes as often in the podcast because People aren't going to the show notes. The show notes are really not for you. They're for Google. Google uses them to do something called search engine optimization. Boring, right? What it briefly means is that if you want to go into Google and you want to search for something about wargaming, and maybe we've covered it on the show, Google knows to show you us higher up in the results because we have show notes and things like that. So we want to have show notes, but don't need to spend as much time because our show notes are really long, right? There's a reason why uh, we pay Joshua to write them. I think I want to go to a more abbreviated version. It will be a paragraph or two instead of this long, long thing so that the show notes can still exist. I'm not going to hype them up on the podcast, but they'll be there for Google. And that maybe as I have time, I can do blog posts as well, like I did about painting the Ironclad Miniatures field positions to kind of bring these together and do that. And if there are actually any show notes kind of things that might be of interest to you, what I think I want to do is I want to put them in a new place. We're doing an e-newsletter that we're trying to get off the ground and we would love for you to sign up so that you can get it. And maybe the show notes will just go in there so that way you can get it in your email. It'll have a link to the podcast so you can download it that way. We'll still have it on our social media and all that kind of stuff. But you'll be able to get it this way and just kind of make life a little easier for you should you want to go and do that. So you can sign up for our um, for our e-newsletter by going to on Facebook if you want. On It's on our Facebook page. It's on our fan club page. Uh, we're going to have a link on our website as well. But the easiest way to do it is just go to wargamingrecon.com slash get newsletter. That's all one word, get newsletter. And then you just fill that out, your name, your email address, you opt in for what kind of stuff you want to get. And it adds you to it. Every so often we'll send out a newsletter that'll have content in it and things that we're working on, upcoming product reviews, all that kind of stuff. So you can have all that and know what's happening. So maybe that's the way to go because we can do a newsletter. It won't take a ton of time. It will actually take less time to do it every so often in there rather than these really in-depth show notes and other kind of things. So by kind of readjusting where time is spent, 
We can prioritize what's most important for all of you and still keep it to be as valuable and interesting for everyone without using a ton of time on our end. So I think that's about what we have here. I want to thank all of you for listening. I want to thank our Patreon backers for supporting the show. I want to thank our sponsors who you've heard at the start and you'll hear at the end of the episode. We'll probably be condensing things. You'll still get the sponsor messages, but maybe not as much of the other stuff going on in the audio um, because you don't need all those credits. I'm spending more time on Twitter, so you can check us out at wargamingrecon.com slash tweet, I believe it is, or just look up Wargaming Recon on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Uh, We have an Instagram, but we're not using that so much, so... Wargaming Recon on Facebook, Wargaming Recon on Twitter. Check those things out. We're trying to share more content and do that kind of stuff. Check out the Wargaming Recon fan club on Facebook. And that's an episode. So if you're looking for wet palette information, check out this episode. Check out the Everlasting wet palette. Check out the P3 wet palette. Try making your own homemade wet palette. If you want some more detailed instructions or advice on that, go to our fan club. Get in touch with me check it out and see what we can do well no matter how busy you are no matter what's going on in your life no matter how much time you're spending trying to get just the right wet palette for your painting needs you know that you have to you gotta you need to keep on gaming